Alan Siegel. Yeah. Rory, thank you very much. You know, um, I'm amazed at the turnout. Either we have too many people in Warren with too much time on their hands, or we have a lot of history buffs. And I prefer to think that we have a, a lot of history buffs in Warren Township, and that's good. Uh, you know, when, when historians are not researching or writing history, and this goes for history buffs as well, uh, they like to talk about the what ifs of history. What if Julius Caesar had not been assassinated? Think about that one. What if George Washington had tripped, fallen, and been killed just before the Battle of Trenton? How different would this country be? What if Napoleon had won at Waterloo? What if Adolf Hitler had never been born? I could go on. Indeed, there's a book called, of all things, What If? 900 pages of what ifs. It's a fascinating thing. You can go through here. All the things that happened but could have happened differently due to the people involved, the events, weather, who knows what. So we're going to do a little what ifing here, right here in Warren Township. Um, I want to do it uh, quickly so we can get into the slide presentation. But the question I pose is, what if a baby boy had not been born in the kingdom of Württemberg on April 4th, 1848. Now you know who I'm talking about. It's Nathan Hoffheimer. Would Warren be the same town it is today? I want to crank the time machine up. Does somebody have the key to it? I have it. We're going to crank the time machine up to 1825. What was the center of Warren Township in 1825? It was Union Village. Union Village was an up and coming place. It had a church, a post office, a general store, and just down the uh, road a little bit, the uh, Methodist camp meetings attracted 5,000 people in the summer. That was the place to be, Union Village. Now we're going to turn the dial to 1900. I wish we could actually do this, huh? I think we'd all like to turn the dial back a little bit. But anyway, let's turn it to 1900. What was the center of Warren Township? Mount Bethel. Mount Bethel had the oldest church in Warren Township. It had a post office. It had a, a hotel. It had meeting rooms for clubs and organizations. And it had a bar where you could have a few of those if you were thirsty. That was the center of Warren Township. And during those two periods of time, this area down here was nothing. Nothing to speak of, nothing to write home about. Now let's turn the dial to the year 2000. Mount Bethel is nothing today. Union Village is nothing, but Warrenville is the center of the town. It's got the town hall, the library, the police department, the fire department. It doesn't have a church, uh, but it has all the amenities of a municipality. It is, Warrenville is the center of Warren Township, New Jersey. And I'm going to take a giant leap here and ask the question, if Nathan Hoffheimer, who is the founder of the family here in New Jersey, had not been born on April 4th, 1848, in the Kingdom of Württemberg, would Warrenville now be the center, the downtown of Warren, New Jersey? I think a very good case could be made that it wouldn't be the center of, town, of Warren. It would just be another intersection with some houses and a few stores here and there. That's the importance of a single person. Now, when Nathan was born in 1848, he wasn't thinking about things like that. I think he was trying to keep himself dry and warm, like most of us when we're babies. Uh, but that's what happened. It's one of the great what ifs of history. Now, we only have a little bit of time. It's a long story, and I can only hit the highlights. If you'd like to get a copy of this booklet, it will be for sale after the meeting. It's $5. That just covers the cost. Nobody's making any profit on it, of course. Um, but uh, that's the reason I wrote the book on Hofheimer, because everywhere you turn in this town, you're talking about Hofheimer. In fact, this very building, while it doesn't look anything like it did when the original part of it was built by the Hofheimer family, this used to be a Hofheimer building. And if you're old enough and you remember coming to the library here, you will remember what it looked like before it was modified, changed so much. But this structure, good portion of what's here today, 
was built by the Hofheimer family. You can't go anywhere in downtown Warren without being touched by the Hofheimers. Uh, now, let's turn to the first slide. I'm going to, sometimes I'm going to tell Rory when to turn, and sometimes he kind of, kind of guess when we have to move on. But uh, the, the, uh, the town in uh, Germany, the kingdom of Württemberg, there was no Germany in 1848, uh, where Hofheimer was born was called Budenhausen. It's still there. Uh, and uh, this is a picture, blurry, but it's a picture of the Jewish cemetery in uh, Budenhausen. And uh, Nathan was very fortunate in being born there as opposed to some other place in what later became Germany. Because 50 years before he was born, the local count decided he had to get something going in that part of his uh, area. It was a farming area. Nothing much was going on. There was nothing, no, no, no activity. And what he decided to do was he brought 50 Jewish families into Budenhausen. He got them to move from other parts of Germany into Budenhausen. And that was the key to the growth of this town. Those people uh, brought a sense of capitalism, enterprise ship, uh, commercialism, industrialism into Budenhausen, and they created a community there that uh, was uh, active, uh, and uh, that was the community in which Nathan Hofheimer was born. Now, if we could turn the slide to this, this is the family house in Budenham, uh, Budenhausen, and you can see the name on there. It's, uh, it says B. Budenheimer uh, Zona, I think, which means Budenheim and Sons. Uh, the, um, the family uh, put out the story years later that poor Nathan was, uh, that Nathan was poor when he came to this country. Well, Nathan Hoffarmer was not poor when he ultimately emigrated to the United States. Um, and let's, there he is right now, uh, here, and this is Nathan before he emigrated to the United States. He's about 18 years old there, and I, what I love is this thing right here. That's a cigar in his hand. Uh, so he was, I don't know what else he was doing that he shouldn't have, but here he is posing in this picture, uh, taken in Mannheim, which is near Budenhausen, and uh, you can see that uh, Nathan came from a very prosperous family. Uh, but some members of his family had already emigrated to the United States, uh, they had settled in the Midwest, and uh, where they had set themselves up as merchants, just as they were in Budenhausen. Uh, they were basically commission merchants. They imported fine wines, uh, liquor, cigars. Maybe that's why he's holding a cigar. It could be. And tobacco. And they did very well for themselves in the Midwest. Kentucky, Ohio, Indiana, Missouri, that general vicinity right there is where they settled when they came to this country. And as I say, they did quite well. We can try the next one now. Nathan came to this country in 1866. He was only 18 years old. He came over by himself. Uh, he landed at Castle Garden. How many here have actually seen Castle Garden? Because it still exists. OK, we got two? I'm sure other people have seen it and didn't know. This is on the lower. Uh, part of um, Manhattan Island. It's called the Battery, I think. And it still stands. Uh, but until Ellis Island opened up, uh, this is where the immigrants would come. And they would stay. They would step off at Castle Garden, which used to be a fort uh, after the Revolutionary War. And this is where uh, he came, uh, took a train, and traveled to the Midwest to join his relatives. Probably, probably went to Cincinnati. We can go to the next picture now. Now we have a few pictures here of what Nathan looked like uh, in his early years in the United States. As I say, he was in uh, Ohio, Kentucky, Missouri, and he got himself established in the whiskey business. Um, now, today a lot of people uh, drink wine, they drink whiskey, they drink beer, but in the 1860s and 1870s and 1880s and 1890s, whiskey was the thing. Uh, whiskey was the beverage of choice of many Americans. Uh, beer, maybe the Germans drank that. Wine, only rich people drank that. But whiskey, now that was, that was the business to get into if you wanted to make some good money. And that's the business Nathan Hoffheimer got into. We can go to the next picture. Here's a little bit later picture taken of him. 
he first got into the um, sales business. He went around selling uh, whiskey to people in that general area. And then he became involved in a distillery. I think it was in Kentucky, which does make, which makes a lot of sense. He was a, a distiller in Kentucky, made some money there. Uh, and as I say, he learned a great deal about business and he made a great deal of money. Uh, we'll turn to the next slide. In fact, he made enough money that in 1899, this is the vehicle he bought. We have a couple car pictures of him in a car. Um, I think he's the one on the right. Uh, it's a little hard to tell exactly, but it does. it's labeled as his 1899 vehicle. Uh, and um, I don't think you'd take that out in the winter, but uh, he, certainly had, he certainly had a lot of money. There's no question about it. Now, it is uh, a little unclear when you look at the, um, the history of the Whiskey Trust, whether Nathan Hoffheimer was involved in it. The Whiskey Trust was similar to the Sugar Trust and the Steel Trust and all the other trusts that developed in the United States after the Civil War. Now, we all know about antitrust, but antitrust comes from the trusts. So first you get the trusts, and then you get the antitrust movement. And among the many trusts that developed in the United States was the Whiskey Trust. Now, it was similar to the, tr the Standard Oil Trust, for example, which controlled the distribution of oil, petroleum products. But the Whiskey Trust controlled the distribution of whiskey. And the idea was, if you could make it rarer, it would be more expensive. And that was the idea of a trust, of course, to control the distribution and production of the item. Uh, now, uh, he made a lot of money, a lot of money. Even after the Whiskey Trust was uh, ruled illegal by the federal courts in the 1890s, he was still in the whiskey business. Now, but by 1890, Nathan was in New York City. We're going to just talk a little bit about Nathan Hoffheimer and how he moved into another field of endeavor and the one where he made the greatest amount of money. Now, when he was in New York City, if you, if you um, uh, pull up the New York Times or any other newspaper that period, you will find references to Nathan Hoffheimer. Now, one uh, newspaper called him a well-known New York whiskey speculator, which means that he would buy and sell whiskey by the case uh, and uh, he, would make, he would make money on doing that. Another newspaper called him a bright, pushing man of undoubted ability. This was Nathan when he was about 50 years old. And uh, another newspaper tells the story of a, another kind of trust that Nathan tried to set up. He went into a partnership with somebody from another country, England. They got together $6 million, which was a lot of money in the, around 1900, in 1890, rather. They got together $6 million, and they were going to try to corner the market on bourbon whiskey. Didn't work. Wasn't enough money. $6 million is a lot of money. Today, it would be hundreds of millions of dollars. Imagine Nathan Hoffheimer, the poor boy from Budenhausen, who was able to manage that trick. Uh, but uh, those were the days when a million dollars actually meant something. Today, not so much. Whether he was very wealthy in 1900, you can draw your own conclusions from that. We have no evidence. We don't have any paperwork that tells us how much money Nathan Hoffheimer was worth. But you can draw your own conclusions from what I just told you. Now, let's just stop for a moment and look at uh, his family life to the extent we know anything about his family life. Uh, in 1871, now he was here in the United States for three years, he became a naturalized United States citizen. Never moved back to Germany, did visit a number of times. In fact, there's passport records that are available if you go on the internet and you'll find passport records for his trips back to Germany but he didn't stay there. He, the United States was his home. Uh, and in 1872, two years after he became a citizen, uh, he married his 18-year-old cousin, of all things, uh, Helene uh, Rosengard, whose family had also come from Budenhausen. So there, there was a family connection there. Now, it was when uh, Nathan and Lena lived in uh, Louisville, Kentucky, 
again, the center of whiskey uh, distribution, that they had their three children, Roni, Arthur, and Lester. And we'll come back to Arthur a little bit later uh, in the talk here. Now, Nathan was a very large person, larger than Mr. Britt. He was uh, six feet, five inches tall, well built. Uh, he always dressed in the finest clothing. Uh, and he spoke, his associates said, with a pronounced German accent. And I'm guessing he probably had a cigar in his hand at the same time, and maybe a glass of bourbon on the side, uh, because that was the nature of the life he led at that time. Uh, now, around 1900, I think Nathan got a little tired of the whiskey business. He had been in it for 30 years. He had made his money. He had done what he could do, and he started looking around for something else to do. Again, we don't have anything that tells us exactly that that's what happened, but you can, you can read between the lines and see that that's what happened. In fact, he started investing in a bicycle and an, an umbrella business in Connecticut, a little bit different than whiskey. Then he invested in a celluloid manufacturing company in Newark. You remember the old celluloid collars that Ben used to wear, I don't think there's anybody here who ever had a celluloid collar, but you've heard of them. That was a big business, and he invested in that. And then he, he put some money in another company They made steel wire. So he was looking around for something else to do. He was living in New York with his family, his wife and his children, looking for something in which to invest his money. He was a capitalist. Nothing wrong with that. That's how the world moves. But it was in 1907, that's the fatal year, not fatal, excuse me, the fateful year, the fateful year for Nathan Hoffarmer and Warren Township. Because it was in 1907 that he began, he began buying stock in the Heaney Lamp Company of York, Pennsylvania. Now, I know you haven't heard of the Heaney Lamp Company. Probably haven't even heard of Heaney. Uh, but in 1907, that's what was happening in the automobile business. Now, you've got to understand that until Heaney came along, if you had headlights on your vehicle, and you, you had to have them at night, you couldn't see where you were going, they were driven by an acetylene, a tank of acetylene. And if you wanted to light the lights on your automobile, you had to get out of your vehicle, and you had to strike a match, and you had to get the acetylene going, and then you had to put the match toward the acetylene, and if it didn't blow up in your face, you might have had some headlights. Now that's a lot of work. It's kind of dangerous. Uh, and um, Heaney came up with an idea that when I tell you what it is, you'll say, aha, I wish I had thought of that. He came up with the idea of a better auto headlight uh, in which the light operated on an electric current furnished by a generator, and the current was stored in a battery. And that's where he came, he came up with that idea, or at least so he said he did. And he said he came up with that idea, and he tried to patent that idea. Uh, now, uh, it was not messy, it wasn't dangerous, and it is what we basically have today, of course. Um, and it was in Tahini's company in York, Pennsylvania, that Hofheimer poured a great deal of money. Now, in 1910, Along comes, you can have them. That was Heaney, by the way. Now we have a picture of Will Durant. Anybody ever hear of Will Durant? Come on, somebody must have heard of Will. One person. Oh my God, two people. Three, four, now, nah, listen, now we're going, right? Okay. I'm sure you know of him uh, if you think about it a little bit. Uh, Will Durant is a gentleman who founded General Motors. Twice, basically, if you want to get into it. And I can't get into the details of it. But Will Durant was a carriage maker in the Midwest. And he had the idea, why all these small automobile companies, let's get them together. Let's bring them together under one large company and we will make more money, of course, and we'll make a better vehicle and we'll sell more of them. And he founded General Motors in about 1910. And one of his ideas was to get good headlights on his vehicles and so he went to Heaney and he bought out the Heaney Lamp Company uh, for $7 million. Now again, doesn't sound like a lot of money, I'm pocket change, but today that could be maybe $300 million. 
Now, rumor has it, again, not positive, rumor has it that Hofheimer's share, because remember, Hofheimer had bought stock in the Heaney Company, that he, his share was $1,750,000 in GM stock. That would have been worth maybe 10 or $15 million. Now, of course, it wasn't the best investment that Durant ever made in the automobile business, because it turns out that the General Electric Company, which is another combination, General Motors, General Electric, another combination of electric companies, they said they had invented the headlight. And they sued Heaney, and it turned out that the Heaney patents probably were not worth $7 million, but that's, uh, that's the way it works in, in big business. In any event, uh, Hofheimer was there, he was in New York City, and he now had, he had some pocket change, all right? Now, I don't want to dwell on the ups and downs of Durant's career, it's a fascinating story, but it, it appears from what we can tell that Hofheimer rode the roller coaster with Durant. When Durant was up, Hofheimer was up, and when Durant was down, Hofheimer was there to lend him more money. Uh, Durant went through a lot of money as he combined General Motors, he lost control of General Motors. He then bought Chevrolet, and then he merged Chevrolet into General Motors, and then he owned General Motors for a second time. It's a fascinating story. That's where your Buicks and your Cadillacs come from, Oldsmobile, Pontiacs. And here uh, is uh, a fancy Buick from about 1918 and 1919. This is where all the money was coming in now from the sale of cars like that. Uh, the, um, and I'm sure that plenty of people wish they had a car just like that parked in their garage now. It'd be worth a lot of money. They're beautiful, at least I think so. Now, one of Durant's associates said of him, and this is from a book about Durant, he said, if he liked you, he made you rich. If he liked you, he made you rich. And in Nathan's case, that proved true. Uh, by the time Nathan Hofheimer died, at the age of 73, in 1921, he was reportedly worth $30 million, which, if you do the calculations, is about $400 million today. So, uh, from the young boy from Budenhausen, uh, who came from a very respectable and well-to-do family, he parlayed that with brains uh, and ability into a fortune. Uh, now, uh, the uh, uh, Hofheimer was not the kind of person who would keep all that money for himself. He gave a lot of it away. Uh, the Hofheimer uh, Foundation, again, we don't know anything about it today. We've forgotten about it. But he, uh, before he died, his family put about $20 million into the Hofheimer Foundation. And it lasted until 1970, when it gave out funds to charities across the United States. And uh, although Hofheimer was Jewish, didn't make any difference whether it was a Jewish or a Gentile charity, uh, the Hofheimer Foundation was there to help. Uh, in fact, uh, during the years leading up to the Second World War, the uh, foundation was instrumental along with other organizations of bringing uh, German scientists to this country to escape the Nazis. Uh, they could have been Christians or Jews, it didn't make any difference, but they brought those people out, academics brought them out of Germany and settled them here in the United States. And the Hofheimer Foundation was very active in that, uh, in that aspect. So much for, uh, we can go on the next slide. Uh, so much for, we'll stay there, that's Arthur Hofheimer, one of Nathan's sons. Now comes the great mystery of all. Why did Nathan Hofheimer come to Warren, New Jersey? Now he's in New York City, he's living on Park Avenue, probably a very fancy apartment, a great deal of money, a lot of influence. New York Times writes about him. Uh, big owner in uh, General Motors. Why did he come here to Warren, New Jersey? Well, again, one of these mysteries, we have nothing written down. I came to Warren because, no, we don't have that. We have to piece it together. And I, and I think the reason uh, has a number of aspects to it. First of all, he was getting older. He was in his 60s, 
he wanted to relax a little bit. He was very interested in thoroughbred horsing, horse, uh, horses. He really wanted to raise the horses, race the horses. You couldn't do that in, in, in a, uh, an apartment on Park Avenue in New York City. He was looking for a farm somewhere where he could go in the summertime, do his uh, thing with his horses, enjoy himself, relax, get away from the heat of the city. Of course, we didn't have air conditioning then, but it was cool around the country. Uh, and um, that was part of it. I think the second part uh, was that uh, Warren is relatively close to the train that takes you to your New York City. You can get to Plainfield, where there's a large train station, relatively quickly. Uh, and um, you can then take the train to New York City where you do business. You do your whatever business you're doing over there. So Warren had farms for sale. It was close to a train station where you could get to the train. Of course, we're not like uh, Chatham or Maplewood or something like that where the train station is right in the center of town, but it's nearby. You can get to it. And I think that's probably that confluence of influences are probably what brought uh, him here. And maybe he saw an ad in a newspaper somewhere, farm for sale in Warren Township. Where is Warren Township? But he came here and uh, I think they fell in love with the place and they found that there was land here that they could buy. Now, the first member of the family to come here was Arthur Hoffheimer. There he is. Again, I guess uh, doing pretty well for himself. He uh, worked for his father in the Heaney Lamp Company in New York, Pennsylvania. I'm sure he did very well. Uh, and uh, talk about celluloid collars, right? And uh, I'm sure he did well, very well for himself. Um, and uh, it was in 1911 that Arthur, the son of Nathan, was the first to buy property here in Warren Township. And they bought 150 or 160 acres right where the Pheasant Run uh, Shopping Center is now. And that was all farmland. There was a house, a couple of houses there. They bought the houses, they bought the land. Um, and actually it was 129 acres. Not a, not a great deal of money. You can go to the next picture. There's Nath, there's Arthur and his uh, four children and his wife Helen. About the same time period. Probably taken in New York City. So what he did is he, he um, rebuilt the house that was on the property and he uh, made it the focus of his uh, gentleman farm. It's where he would, uh, he had greenhouses in the back. It's where he would uh, putter around out in the uh, summer uh, here in Warren Township uh, and um, uh, have a good time for himself, then hop the train and go back to New York City. By then, I don't think he was working in Pennsylvania, uh, but he might have been. He might have been in York, Pennsylvania. So let's see the next picture there. There he is. Uh, very distinguished looking gentleman. He actually had uh, been in the army during the Spanish-American War and um, he didn't go overseas. Most of the soldiers in the Spanish-American War never did go overseas, so that's not a mark against him. Uh, he was like most of them, he stayed here in the country. Uh, and he contracted some kind of an infection uh, while he was in the army and he died from that actually, uh, but it was a number of years later. He was young, but um, in the uh, turn of the century, he was still vital and active and came to Warren Township. Now, uh, as I say, they spent thousands of dollars remodeling the house. We'll go to the next picture. And built what became known as the eaves. Now, the eaves doesn't exist anymore. Uh, but it was a three-story. You can see the top stories behind the trees there. Um, in a kind of pseudo-Greek revival look to it. Uh, there's a house on the left. You see the chimney on the left? That's, that's another house over there. Uh, so there were a couple houses. There's a house on the left. And here's the eaves right here. That's the third story up there. Uh, and um, it faced uh, Warrenville Road. You know where Dunkin' Donuts is now? Well, that's where the eaves was. And it faced uh, uh, Warrenville Road. Now, uh, it had screened in porches. You can see here in the front. Right here, screened in porches all on the side. Uh, two story columns in the front, kind of Greco Roman. And uh, as I say, they called it the eaves. 
Now, unfortunately, in the year 1928, a year after Arthur died when he was 50 years old, the eaves burned to the ground. Now, we did have a fire department here in Warren, the Mount Bethel Fire Department, but, you know, I mean, uh, it's not easy to put fire out. Uh, and uh, they had a, a, a lot of trouble uh, doing it. Um, fire departments from throughout the area were called. Um, and even the New York Times, I think, wrote up the story about what happened. The eaves burned to the ground, actually. And um, it's ballroom, fancy ballroom. It's basement wine cellar. It's ice making machinery. Its refrigerators and its library ended up a smoldering ruin. And um, according to local lore, the only thing that was saved was the wine cellar. And that was by the fire department. They got in there and saved that. So that's something. <laughs> um, now, so the eaves doesn't, is not there anymore. For many years, the greenhouses that were behind the eaves was part of a florist that was right there in that location. Does anybody remember the florist that was there? I think it might have been called, uh, I had an Italian guy owned it, I can't think of his name. Huh? That's it, right there. That was the florist, right? Those greenhouses were built by Arthur Hoffheimer. That's all gone now. Uh, there's no, nothing left of that. Now, uh, a couple of years after Arthur came to Warren, his father and mother came, Nathan and Lena, and they bought a house on this property that was owned by the Reverend Hauser, another H. Uh, and um, they bought that plus another couple hundred acres right here, right next to their son's property. And they remodeled the house, spent about $50,000 on it, which is a lot of money today and then too, and turned it into a uh, beautiful house. You want to turn to the next slide? Uh, oh, before we go there, I, I, I forgot. We have a couple of pictures of the interior of the eaves. This is the breakfast room. Quite nice. And then let's turn to the next. This is the living room of the eaves. So you can see this is a very fancy house. Very fancy for Warren, New Jersey. All right, so that's a picture, that's a painting of Nathan Hoffheimer. What he looked like about the time that he moved to Warren, New Jersey. And let's move on to the next one. And that's his wife, Lena Hoffheimer. These are paintings. I don't know where they ended up, uh, but they are, pardon me? Family. The family has them. Uh, Rory knows a few members of the family. Uh, the family has the paintings. Now we go on to the next picture. Uh, it's a little hard to see, unfortunately, but the Hauser house was, wasn't big, but it was not a shack. Uh, the Hoffheimer family bought the Hauser house, um, and they looked to uh, architects in Plainfield by the name of Augustus Marsh and uh, Otto Getty uh, to uh, remodel the building. And what they did is they turned it into um, something very, very impressive for the period. Now, uh, the Getty and Marsh uh, were very well-known architects. You, if you, uh, if you um, Google their names, you will find that a couple of books were printed with their architectural plans in them back in the 1890s. They were designing houses. Uh, they did any kind of house you want. You want a Greek Revival temple, you got it. Uh, you want a Dutch colonial, it's yours. You name it, they would design it. And some of their houses still stand, besides the Hofheimer house. There were houses in Plainfield, uh, in Summit, and suburbs of New York that were designed by Marsh and Getty. But they were the foremost architects of Plainfield and they were engaged to design the Hofheimer house. Now, this is a drawing of the Hofheimer house. They're probably not too clear. That's one side. You can see it's uh, three stories. I think we'll skip this slide because you can't see too much. And there we are. This is a picture of it today. Of course, again, three stories. Stucco siding. Looks a little bigger than it was when the Hofheimers owned it because the porches were all filled in when the town took it. It's in what's called the craftsman style. Now, if you're not an architectural buff, you may not know the craftsman style was very popular in 1900 or so. And uh, what, uh, what it features, I think my pages got a little mixed up here. Uh, what, it, what it features is um, porches, uh, which are here filled in, but they were porches there. Uh, a lot of stucco was common. 
overhanging eaves. And here you can see a couple of brackets underneath the um, porch here. There were a lot more brackets like that around the building uh, on both sides and around it. That was fairly common of the craftsman style. And uh, while the building has been much changed uh, since it was built, uh, it, um, it, was, uh, it was something. It was something to see. Now, um, let's see, do we have another picture of the, uh, that's a picture of Augustus Marsh, who was the engine, one of the two architects. Let's move on to the next one. And then the lodge was also part of the construction project. This is the lodge. We are sitting in what you originally was the lodge. And again, you can see the brackets under the porch overhang there. You can see the large overhangs, the chimneys, very similar to the Hofheimer house, right there, chimneys, stucco siding. And this uh, was the place where the servants lived. Now, you had to have servants, and they had the servants living there. The gardener also lived there. Uh, they had their horses downstairs for a brief period of time. Uh, not the thoroughbreds that Hofheimer was raising, but the horses that he would use to drive around in. And uh, and ultimately, it became the place where the uh, where the cars the cars were. Now uh, the main house, the main house, and that's uh, sitting uh, right over there. Of course, uh, it was um, as you might expect a wonder, because these were wealthy people and they built wealthy. Uh, it had 21 rooms, five bathrooms, had a telephone switchboard that connected all the houses. It didn't connect the mausoleum, though. They had no phone in the mausoleum. I'll get there in a minute. Uh, it had a dishwasher, a central vac system, which many of us probably don't even have today. Uh, it had a panel living room, stained glass, uh, all the modern improvements and conveniences that you would want if you were building a house, uh, and if you were very rich. Uh, the people of Warren Township, now there were then 1,099 of them, the people of Warren Township truly had never seen anything like this before. Uh, they were scratching out a living, uh, and here were some very, very wealthy people, and they were mightily impressed. Indoor plumbing, my God, what was the world coming to? I'm sure that's what they thought. Now, the grounds surrounding the Hofheimer House were, uh, needless to say, designed by the foremost uh, landscaping firm of the time, the Olmsted Brothers. Now, if you're not aware of it, the Olmsted, the father, Frederick uh, Olmsted, designed, along with a couple other people, designed New York Central Park. Became very famous, became very popular. If you go to South Mountain, I think it's South Mountain Reservation in Essex County, he designed that. He did all over the country, designed the parks that today people enjoy. Uh, when he died, his two sons took over the business, the Olmsted brothers. And they uh, were engaged by the Hofheimers to design the grounds around here. We have a drawing. Uh, I don't think I have a picture of it. No, leave that one on the screen, though. Uh, they designed the, um, the grounds. Uh, and um, I got to say, they had, um, they had uh, according to, and this is a clipping from the Courier News from 1956, they said the towering shade trees, clean clipped hedgerows, Several small lakes and acres of rolling lawn enhanced the beauty of the estate. That's what it looked like up until the town took it over in 1956. There was a seven-hole golf course right on the corner where the King's Supermarket was for many, many years. That was a seven-hole golf course for the Hofheimer family, not for the rest of us. So, um, and today, the only thing left of the landscaping that I think we've ever been able to find I think the large scotch, uh, maybe the white pines that are in front of the new library and that part, they could be from the uh, Olmsted Brothers design. And there is a ginkgo tree in front of the Hofheimer house that I think it's possible that was part of the Olmsted Brothers design. So that, that's gone. And of course, it's 100 years, so you could anticipate things would change. Now, at the rear of the family compound, now you got the house and the lodge. We're in the lodge. That's the house over there. At the rear of the family compound, actually in Greenbrook, is the Hofheimer Mausoleum. Now, I'm sure you've all heard of the Hofheimer Mausoleum. How many people have been there? 
A lot of people have been to the Hot Fire Mausoleum. I wouldn't suggest going there now. We'll get to that. Um, it was a uh, pseudo-Roman temple uh, made out of dark granite. Uh, it was designed to hold 16 crypts, places where you could bury people, 16. He was very optimistic. It was built of 200 tons of granite that was shipped to Plainfield by rail, and then it was carted up to Warren by horse-drawn vehicles. Uh, now, ultimately, buried in the mausoleum was Nathan. He was buried there. His wife, who died about a year after he did, was also buried there. And Arthur, when he died in 19, I think he's 1928, 25, he was buried there too. So there were three uh, members of the High Fire family uh, buried in the mausoleum. And they lay, they lay there at rest until uh, the 1950s when the bodies were moved to the Hillside Cemetery in um, Scotch Plains. Now, uh, the, the mausoleum doesn't look too bad. You can see uh, down here some garbage, um, a pile of junk over here. Uh, the mausoleum, I'm sorry to relate, has had a very checkered career, uh, if mausoleums have careers. But uh, it has a checkered career. In the 1960s, 1970s, and 1980s, it uh, became totally run down and dilapidated, and it became a hangout for teenagers. Uh, and a magazine called Weird New Jersey, I'm sure you've, you've heard of it, uh, claimed it was haunted by witches. I, I don't quite get that at all, but uh, that's what they claimed. Anything to sell a magazine, I guess. And that even drew more people, uh, young people. People our age and sensibility wouldn't bother, but the young people, you know. And out they went uh, uh, to the mausoleum, and uh, when Rory and I were first involved in this, it was a total wreck. And uh, we were able to convince the township to uh, spend some money. Uh, and they sandblasted the uh, slogans off the granite and cleaned the thing up, made it look pretty darn good. Uh, and a place that you would want to, you would want to visit. It's just backed by the Public Works Department in the back there. But it's still there. Now, to the west of this uh, Hofheimer house was the, is the Elks Lodge. You've all seen it. It's down in that general vicinity over there. Just go through the parking lot. On the other side is the Elks Lodge. Now, that was once the home of Aileen uh, Ronnie Hoffheimer. Oh, my God, there she is. Uh, she was a famous aviatrix. She was one of Arthur's children. Um, and before the property was sold to the Elks, it had a 60-foot in-ground swimming pool, a bathhouse, a picnic grove, several ponds, footbridges, and a walking trail. Um, so uh, it was pretty fancy. It was kind of a mini Hofheimer house. And Aileen, when she wasn't out flying all over the country, um, made, it, made it her uh, stop in the summertime. Now, as I said, she was the daughter of Arthur and Helen, his wife. She was born in 1909. She married twice, got divorced twice. She married a fellow named Bamberger. Uh, and um, they got divorced, and then she married a, I think it was a nephew of Lady Astor. Go figure. And um, that marriage lasted a couple of years. They had no, she had no children, but she did fall in love with flying. And you can see that right there. Uh, during World War, now, in 1934, I don't want to miss this, in 1934, she was the first woman to fly solo from New York City to Mexico City. And she went down there to visit her artist friend, Diego Rivera, who, of course, was a communist. But that's beside the point. He was also, he was also a well-known art. <laughs> a well-known artist. Now, during World War II, of course, women uh, uh, weren't in combat. But there were a lot of women involved in the uh, military on the side of the Allies. Uh, she drove an ambulance in France. Uh, she flew heavy bombers, believe it or not. Uh, not to go out and bomb uh, sites in Germany, but to deliver them from the factory uh, to the place where they were needed. She was part of a ferrying service that ferried the large aircraft from one place to another. And that freed up the mail bar, uh, flight, uh, um, the mail pilots who could then uh, actually fly the combat missions. Um, and uh, in, the year, in the year 2010, this is 50 years after she died. Uh, she was inducted into New Jersey's Aviation Hall of Fame. 
Here she is um, on one of the planes that uh, it, it's clearly a, a military craft. But uh, that was the daughter of Arthur Hoffheimer, who you could have, she might have walked around here in Warren in the 20s and 30s. Now, uh, behind the Elks Lodge is uh, perhaps the most unique feature of the Hofheimer compound, and it's the grotto. Anybody been to the grotto? Of course, more people have been to the grotto than to the mausoleum. Well, I think it's interesting, and more people over here have visited these historic sites than over here. So you're gonna have to get yourself a little active this summer and go to some of these historic sites. They're right here in Warren, you know? Uh, the grotto, the story of the grotto, of course, what is a grotto? It's a pool of water uh, with some fancy rock work around it, and waterfalls, man-made waterfalls. Water comes out, splashes around, it bubbles. It's a nice, cool place to go, to sit around the edges, watch the water flow. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, the story of the grotto is an interesting one. It begins in 1871 when a uh, farmer named Manning Coddington, I'm sure you've heard of the Coddington family, he was out there one day, he was digging holes for his posts, he was putting a fence in. And all of a sudden, he comes up with this blue rock now, he knew what it was because everybody around here was searching for blue rock because blue rock is an oxidized form of, co of copper. And there were copper mines throughout this whole area. I could go into that, but we don't have the time. He knew he had found something very, very valuable. And uh, he knew it was a bonanza for him. And what he did a year later, he sold his property, this whole area right here, to a speculator for uh, what would be about $220,000 today. So Manning Coddington did pretty well for himself uh, when he found those rocks. Now, off again and on again for the next 40 years, people mined copper at the, um, the, um, the, what became the grotto. Now, it wasn't, they were not real tunnels into the ground, which you think of a mine. This was basically an open pit mine. Kept, people kept digging down and made it bigger and bigger. They piled the spoils off to the side. It was a big hole in the ground. And the problem is, of course, more money went into developing the mine than ever came out in terms of profit. But there was copper there. There was gold. Uh, there was platinum. And there was something called lithia water, which was kind of a carbonated water that people would drink uh, to uh, make them feel better. Uh, so. Uh, what uh, we had by about 1900, 1910, uh, 1915, when the Hofheimer started looking at this property, was a big open pit, and dangerous at that, because it was filled with water, and um, something had to be done about it. Now, a lot of owners would have filled it in, and landscaped and be done with it, not Hofheimer. He remembered Germany, and he remembered the grottos he had seen in Germany, so he got some Italian, no, because not German craftsmen, but he got Italian craftsmen, brought them in, and he built the grotto. So what they did is they brought water from the Middle Brook, which you know passes in our backyard here, and they pumped it. There, there were pumps and the pipes. You can still see the pipes. You can't see the pumps, but you can see the pipes. The water was pumped out of the Middle Brook into the, uh, the caves here, along the side here, and it would gush out, sparkle, uh, nice cool water, fill the grotto, uh, and uh, people would enjoy it. Well, the members of the Hofheimer family would enjoy it, because you and I weren't exactly welcome. But um, it's, uh, there were 12 of these caves there. They're still there. It's still, this is what it looks like today. Uh, it hadn't fallen apart. And if you go back there, ladies and gentlemen, you can do there. There's a walkway that takes you right to it behind the Elks. Uh, you can look at it, you can see these towering pine trees, beautiful. And you can imagine what it would look like if it ever got restored. Now the Elks have tried over the years. They haven't been totally successful, but at least the building, the, the construction is still there. So let's move on to the next slide. I will right, stay with this one. Now in the 20s and 30s, the Hofheimer estate was known as Long Acre Farm. Uh, this is where Arthur Hofheimer's children, Joyce Sicardi and Marjorie Frank, enjoyed raising and training thoroughbred horses, uh, just as their grandfather had done. Now, the grandfather was into horses. They were into horses, something that the rich kids do. 
Uh, Mrs. Frank owned Little Canada, who won an Olympic medal in the 1920s. And um, she served as chairman, get this, you wouldn't believe it. She served as chairman of Plainfield's annual horse show in 1941. Who would believe Plainfield had a horse show, uh, much less an annual horse show. But that's how this area was then. Plainfield, very ritzy. The area around here, a lot of large farms with horses on them. And Joy Sicardi, who was another one of the kids, Arthur's children, she was president of the Board of Education. So the family members spent their summers on Long Acre Farm. Come every day, they packed, into, they packed up their uh, clothing into their Cadillacs, and off they went to their Park Avenue apartments. Now, um, there's a little bit more of the story. I don't want to keep you awake too long, but there's a little bit more of the story. And one of the other parts of the story is the Warren Brook Golf Course. And that's, of course, back here, part of the Hofheimer Estate. You don't remember it, of course, because it's not, it's not a site that you would go visit. But it was once the home of Nathan Hofheimer's uh, granddaughter, Doris Auerbach. The house that's on the structure, this building here. Okay, there we go. That was built for Doris Auerbach, right after she got married. She and her husband moved in there. Uh, and um, they lived there a good number of years until the property uh, became a private golf course. Because it had been a golf course even when the Hofheimers owned it. There's a pool there, you know. And the pool was built by the Hofheimers. So this was the Hofheimer Auerbach Estate. And it became then a private golf course. And then it became owned by the county of Somerset in 1978. So now it's open to the public. And you can go in there and you can see a pretty fancy building. And we'll go to the next picture. And here's Hickory Hill. Anybody know where Hickory Hill is? OK, that doesn't count. That person in the back is cheating because and, uh, I don't want to hear Rory tell us where it is either. Anybody who's not on the Historic Sites Committee, where is Hickory Hill? There is no prize if you get it right. But uh, Well, Hickory Hill is there. Hickory Hill is there on Mountain Avenue, just where they're building all those new condos uh, by Route 78, just as you, you come off of um, uh, King George Road and you go down Mountain Avenue, you make the turn, and just before you turn toward Wagner Farm, and go over 78, um, that's where Hickory Hill is. You can't see it from the street, uh, and that's why you don't know it. But that's Hickory Hill. That was built by um, uh, the uh, Mrs. Sicardi in 1950. Beautiful. It looks like a, a French chateau. We got another picture of it? There you are. That's there. People still living in it. Um, anybody heard of Phil Levin? Okay, now we got some action going. Phil Levin, <laughs> Phil Levin and his family bought Hickory Hill in the 60s. Um, he was a developer of supermarkets. Levin Management, I think that's the name of the company, is still on Route 22. Next time you pass, I think that's Greenbrook, if I'm not mistaken, down there. It says Levin Management on the building. On the building, that's that's the Levin family, uh, and uh, they lived in Hickory Hill for a number of years as well. Uh, so. Uh, Next time you're on Mountain Avenue, you kind of look around. You might, just in the wintertime, you might possibly see one of the Norman Towers. Now, uh, we're coming to the end of the story. We're up to about the 1950s. By the, uh, up till about the 1950s, Warren didn't have a town hall. You know, how could he have a town without a town hall? Well, Warren didn't have one. When he had 1,000 people living in the town, you didn't need a town hall. You could keep the tax records in somebody's closet. You could keep the archives down in the basement of somebody else, and that's where these things were. And you could have your meetings at the King George Inn, and they afterwards, which they can't do now. They have to go somewhere to do that now. Uh, no, they don't do that. So, uh, but that's how it was in Warren Township in the 1950s. Um, the records were kept in closets uh, and wherever they could find a space for them. But the town fathers, and they were fathers, not mothers at that time. The town fathers, uh, sorry, Susie, the, um, the <laughs> they, got it, they thought, you know, we, we really have to have a town hall. And when the Hofheimer property came on the market in uh, 1956, the town bought what was left, 46 acres, pretty big chunk of property, for $75,000. Uh, and they refurbished, you can stop there, and they refurbished 
the Hofheimer House. They had a well-known architect, uh, Mr. Deadweiler, refurbished the building. Made it quite different, covered up a lot of the architectural features, filled in the porches to make extra room. But the basic building is still standing there. He didn't destroy anything. Might have covered things up, but didn't destroy them. One, in fact, one of the more interesting parts of the Hofheimer house that you wouldn't see is Mr. Hofheimer's safe, which is right in the center of the house. Big safe. That's where he kept his millions, I guess. I don't really know. But uh, the safe is still there. So uh, the town bought the property, and that Hofheimer house was the town hall for the next 60 years. Now, we don't really know what the Hofheimer house inside looked like when the town bought it, except for three pictures. And one of them is, two of them are not the Hofheimer house. This is the garage, and that's this building. So this is downstairs from where we are, where we are now. That could be a Packard, could be a Cadillac, whatever it is sitting there. Um, it's a little hard to say. Have to get a car aficionado. I think it's a Packard. Uh, and there they are. These are the um, members of the township uh, committee at that time looking at the garage and saying, you know, we could put the tax collector down here. <laughs> and, and here's uh, what, what was left of the Olmsted landscaping before it disappeared. <laughs> There's a mausoleum back there. I think that could be Joyce Sicardi right there, but these are members of the township uh, committee looking at this beautiful rhododendron that was in front of the Hofheimer uh, the Hofheimer mausoleum. Thing looks to be about 20 feet tall. It was said to be the biggest one in New Jersey. And then we would take a look at this picture. And this is the living room at the Hofheimer house um, before it was modified by, uh, what's his first name, Charlie Deadweiler? Charlie Deadweiler. Uh, you can see it's very fancy. Bookshelves, chandelier. These are members of that's one of the. I think that's Joyce Sicardi there, and again members of the town committee, looking at the living room, but then became the meeting room, uh, uh, for the uh, and then became the engineering department, and now it's it's basically sitting there empty, um, but uh, that's what that's what it looked like uh, then. Now, I come back to the what ifs of history. Uh, if baby Nathan hadn't been born, uh, would, we, would we be here sitting in the old coach house in the midst of the Hofheimer estate? Uh, would Warrenville be the town center? Or would it be Mount Bethel or maybe Mount Horeb? Who knows? Uh, so uh, as we sit here, we want to remember the, the grotto, the mausoleum, the golf course, the Hofheimer House, the Carriage House, all the land that surrounds us, all part of the Hofheimer story. So I thank you for coming. I hope you enjoyed yourself and learned a little bit about Warren history. So thank you.